Okay, we're preaching on the appearances of God. Look at Job 38 with me. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Sarcasm. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. This is just the beginning of several chapters in the end of Job where God confronts Job. Now the book of Job, as you know, is a book about all of the troubles he went through. The first few chapters provide the setting for the whole story. And then the end of the book we starts with verse chapter 38 and it gets us into the conclusion of all of it. And the whole in-between is just Job talking with his friends and they're just trying to figure out why all this bad stuff has happened to Job. What kind of bad stuff happened to him? Well, you notice in chapter 1, uh, I'll just read a few verses here. Chapter 1, verse 13, There was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabians fell upon them and took them and struck the, down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I have alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. I think it's interesting that the first things that are destroyed in Job's lives were things that dealt with his livestock. Why? Could it be that his livestock was the things he used to worship the Lord with in sacrifice? And one of the first things Satan wants to take out of our lives is our worship. That's why you need to be in church. That's why you need to be giving it all. Amen? Okay, chapter 2, verse 7. Oh, no, no, chapter 1, verse 4, 18. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young people, and they're dead, and I alone escaped to tell you. While now even his kids have died. On down to chapter 2. Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head and he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. Now his body is, is touched and wrecked with all kinds of problems. And the whole book becomes this debate over why these things have happened to Job. Why did all these bad things come to a good man? And so in the Old Testament, there's this idea, that uh, what we call the retribution principle, and that is that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people, right? And that's basically true. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. So whatever, when a man, good man does good things, he'll get good back. And when a bad man does bad things, he'll get but that's not true all the time. There are exceptions to the rule. There are exceptions to the rule, for example, when something bad happens to a good person. Or when something good happens to a bad person. And so what Job is dealing with is all of those exceptions to the rule. In fact, all of the wisdom literature Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Those five books all deal with this question of why, has the, why is there an exception to the rule? Why do some good people die young? Why do some wicked guys prosper and live to be old men? Why do all these things happen? And so... Job gives us, and all the, all the wisdom literature really gives us some answers to this, I think. And I'm going to give these, then I'm going to get off into something else. So y'all hang on. So first of all, the wisdom literature tells us that we don't have the wisdom to understand all the reasons why. 
He just te- they just tell us we don't have the wisdom to understand why all these things go down like they do. Think about the book of Ecclesiastes where the writer of Ecclesiastes is saying, hey man, I looked for you know, the meaning of life and making a lot of money. And I found out that was pointless. I looked for the meaning of life and just enjoying everything I could and found out that was pointless. And I looked for the meaning of life and just having all the women I ever wanted and that was pointless. And, and he comes down to the end And he says this, he said, you know what? I think this is the sum of life, to fear God and keep His commandments, for this is man's all. In other words, the end of life is just to obey God and keep His commandments, and what's missing from this is him saying, and guess what? I couldn't figure it all out. I didn't understand it all. But I just know one thing, if I fear God and I keep His commandments, That's good enough. So it tells us we don't have the wisdom to understand it all. Second thing that the wisdom literature teaches us is that, guess what? In the end, in light of eternity, everything is going to be made right. All of the wrongs are going to be made right. All of the things are going to come into light. All the judgment's going to happen. Everything's going to be weighed out. God's going to be the just judge in the end. The bad's going to suffer. The good's going to be rewarded. The Bible tells us such. Matthew chapter 13, Jesus said, The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and guess what? Cast them into the furnace of fire, where they'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. So in the end, all the bad's going to be dealt with and all the good's going to be rewarded. Same thing happens in Revelation chapter 21. In the end, all those who were cowardly, faithless, detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, yada, 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 all those guys end up in the lake of fire. That's hellfire and brimstone preaching. All of them is going to end up in the lake of fire. Why? Because God's going to correct every injustice in the end. He's going to reward every deed in the end, whether good or bad. It's all coming to light in the end. Can somebody shout amen? Amen. And then finally, the wisdom literature teaches us that even though we don't understand it all and we're waiting for that total revelation, that God is with us right now in the here and now to help us through every problem and every trial that we face. He's with us. Paul said, don't lose heart, 2 Corinthians. Don't lose heart for our light affliction. Light, he was beaten, he was shipwrecked, he was left for dead, he was stoned. Come on. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding weight of glory. In other words, what's happening to me now doesn't compare with what's getting ready to come in the future. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. Psalm 46. God is a very present help in trouble. He didn't leave us saying, hey, you just figure it out on your own. and You just make it by yourself and I can't help you any. No, he said, you know what? You may not understand everything, but I'm going to be right there in the midst of the storm with you. I'm going to be walking with you day and night. I'm going to bed with you. I'm waking up with you. I'm having coffee with you. I'm going to work with you. I'm riding in the car with you. I'm going to be with you through everything you face. Somebody give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. That's worth it. So, okay. So, so there's one of three ways of looking at Job. There's one of three interpretations here. Number one is, it was all Satan's fault. That Satan did everything. That Satan was the one who plagued Job. Satan was the one who killed his family. Satan's the one that took his livestock. Satan did all of this. So we just blame Satan. Or there's another way of looking at it, and that is, well, it's really God's fault. Because God allowed Satan to come and do this. And why did he do that? And blah, blah, blah. And in the third, well, it's all Job's fault. Some preach that Job feared that thing that came upon him. And because of his fear, he opened the door to that. Or Job was self-righteous. And because of his self-righteousness, all this stuff came upon him, which he repented of. Whatever the case, we don't really know. We know Satan was the agent of all the bad that came to him. And we do know that Job did repent in the end. And we do know that God did allow this to happen for some reason. So I didn't help y'all out at all. But here's what happens, and this is what's so cool, man. What happens that's so cool is that God shows up at the end. 
after all of this discussion and all these troubles and who did this and why are you here and if you were really a good person you wouldn't be facing this. And then what Satan comes and tells us? Well, that's what Job's friends would tell. If you were really righteous, only the, only the unrighteous are punished so something's going wrong with you, Job. Blah, blah, blah. And so God shows up and the Bible says He shows up in a whirlwind. Now I don't know, I don't know what that looks like and I don't know where they were sitting, if they were in a tent, if they were, I don't know. But I imagine he shows up and, hold on. It's like, and it's like a tornado comes into the room. A tornado comes in the room and God steps forth. And he looks at Job and he doesn't say, honey, I'm so sorry. I'm going to explain everything to you. You just give me a few moments. I'm going to kiss all your hurts. And I'm going to hold you in my arms. And You know what he did? He stepped out of that whirlwind and he said, Stand up like a man. And take your medicine. <laughs> he didn't say that, but I'm adding that in. Stand up. You, I won't say that either. He comes to rebuke him. And guess what? He didn't answer one of Job's questions. Why did this happen, Lord? He, he's not given that. All the friends, why did this happen? They're not given that. God just shows up. And what he does is he brings exposure. Listen to this. He brings exposure to Job. And when we're exposed to His presence, it brings perspective. Oh, listen to this. When we're exposed to His glory, it brings perspective. What God did was He brought perspective to Job. He doesn't answer any of his questions, but He shows up and He says, Hey man, where were you? Where were you when I stepped out and called the worlds into being? Where were you? When I measured out the heavens. Were you there? When the morning stars shouted for joy. When I flung them out. By the power of my word. Do you know the times and seasons of the animals. And he goes into all this. Can you tame the Leviathan in the ocean? Do you know it? Talk to me man. He comes and just slaps him into reality and he shifts perspective and here's what the shift of perspective does now Job's problems have been great greater than probably any of us have faced but yet God shows up and shows his greatness to Job and shows his awesomeness to Job and in light of the awesomeness and greatness of God the trials that Job was going through seemed pretty small and insignificant in light of who God was so when God comes and shows us his power and shows us his glory it, it opens up a perspective it opens up a vista for us so that we can see things like we've never seen them before so that we can do things that we've never done before so that we can be people who we've never been before I was thinking about a guy named David Oyedepo he's a Nigerian brother and he has I think it's the largest church building on earth in Nigeria. And, and Brother Oyedepo, if you listen to him, he, he has a, his whole property he calls Canaan land. And I think they have a hospital, and they have schools, and they have, it's, it's crazy what they've built there. But when I heard his story, he said what happened was he was exposed to something that gave him a different perspective. He visited Tulsa, Oklahoma years ago and walked the campus of Oral Roberts University. And when he walked that campus, he saw all that a holiness Pentecostal preacher had built. And he said, when I saw that, I thought, I can do this. I can do this. And he went home and he did that. And more. Because sometimes we don't realize how limited our perspective is until God exposes us to something that takes us to the next level. 
That's been, I've preached this stuff since I've been here, that we need to expose ourselves to something greater so we can climb up and get to the next level. I, I was just with uh, Ron Carpenter Jr. for a couple of days, and Ron told us this story. He said years ago he went to Emmanuel College in Georgia, graduated, and, but while he was in Emmanuel, he traveled with the Emmanuel Singers. And one year they went to Florida to sing, and they went to Carl Strader's church in Lakeland, Florida. I don't know if you've ever been there, but Jackie and I have been by the church, and Carl Strader had this, I mean, in the 80s and 90s, it was like probably one of the largest churches in America. It's this huge dome, sea of thousands of people. They had an orchestra pit that was, you know, mechanically, the, the musicians would go down, they would rise mechanically, and Ron Jr. said, I got off, and I looked at that church, and we toured that church, and he said that, he said the platform was bigger than any church I'd ever been in. And I looked at the apartment complexes they had built and the radio towers for the radio stations they owned. And this is what Ron said. He said, I looked up and said, somebody done lied to me. Somebody lied to me. I didn't know this was possible. I didn't know this was possible. But now that I've seen it, I know it's possible. He has a church of 22,000 members now. I think about T.L. Osborne, who was this, I've told this before, but you need to hear it again. T.L. Osborne was just a country farmer, come from a farming family from the country in Oklahoma. He got saved, set on fire for God, ordained through the Pentecostal Church of God, went to India as a missionary, he and his wife, Daisy, through the Pentecostal Church of God. And he goes over to India and he ministers to Indians and he ministers to the Hindus, to the Muslims. And he said, we used the Bible and we tried all of our arguments and all of our rationale and all of our apologetics. And nothing worked. And he said, I came home very unsuccessful after the first stint in India. But just so happened he was in the western states somewhere and he went to a meeting one night with a man named William Branham. And he went to William Branham's meeting that night and he said, Branham brought this young child up in front of everybody and I think the child was cross-eyed and he prayed for this child just calmly and quietly in front of thousands of people. That child was healed completely. And he said, once I saw that, I was sitting up in the balcony and it was as if a thousand voices were speaking to me saying, you can do the very same thing. And so he went back overseas and he started mass crusades where he would pray for the sick and God healed thousands upon thousands of people. Millions of people came to his meetings over the years. He really was the first ever to do mass crusade evangelism. Years ago I had a Rwandan bishop staying in my home who had grown up in Uganda and he saw I, on my shelf I had a bunch of T.L. Osborne books and he says, this is the man that came to Uganda and healed our nation. I'm telling you, perspective means everything. Can somebody shout amen? amen? Come on, raise your hand and say, God, give me a greater perspective. And I believe it comes through encounter and exposure. God showed up in a whirlwind and he lifted up Job's eyes and he said, Son, you've been looking too low. You haven't been understanding what's going on here. I'm taking you up to a new level and I'm getting ready to restore everything that Satan has taken from you. I'm getting ready to double it in your life if you would only listen. What's getting ready to happen? I'm getting ready to expand your view and show you things like you've never seen before. Come on, somebody's getting this in here right now. Come on, raise your hand and say, God, expand my focus, Lord. God, expand my vision of you, God. Give me a new revelation of what I need to see and what I need to do and who I need to be with and who I need to glean from, God. And Lord, open those doors for me today, God. And Lord, bring me out of the past and bring me into my destiny. Somebody shout hallelujah. Come on, shout hallelujah in here. Hallelujah. Oh my gosh, so I get in these meetings, I've been with some, you know, I was in Germany with some amazing men and women of God, then I go and I'm with Kent Christmas, man, and I'm getting my, you know, my hair parted with Kent Christmas in the spirit, and, then, and so I'm just texting my staff, and I, I just told them, I said, I apologize, but I'm going to burn up your phone right now, because there's so much stuff going on in my mind right now, I'm like, holy smoke, why? Just getting some fresh exposure, man. 
Y'all got, some, a lot of you got fresh exposure when you came to this church. Because you, you told me you did. A lot of you guys came in here and you said, man, I, I came into this church and I saw what was, do, what was going on. I saw the move of God. I felt the move of God. And I got mad. Somebody told me they got mad. I said, what did you get mad for? Because I've been in church for 20 years and nobody told me there was a Holy Ghost and nobody told me you could lay hands on the sick and nobody told me I could speak with tongues and nobody told me I could shout and dance and feel the presence of the Lord in church like I do and nobody told me that God could come in and change a drug addict in a moment and God could come in and do what only God can do. Come on, somebody. We need to be exposed to the next level. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, give him a shout and wave right now. You don't know what God can do till you get out there and you see what he can do. Hallelujah. You don't know what God can do till he shows up and he speaks out of the whirlwind. And he says, now my son or my daughter, I'm taking you up and I'm taking you to the next level. I don't know about you, but I don't want to sit in the same place doing the same stuff and not getting anywhere. Come on, I want to go to the next place. Then I want to go to the next place. Somebody said, well, you're talking about next level. It don't make any sense. Well, honey, maybe it don't for you, but it does to me. I don't want to sit, you know, I don't want to sit with the four unbelievers singing the same song for 40 years and not doing anything for Jesus. I want to get out there and go to the next level. God, take me. Maybe the whole providence of God was taking Job up to the next place. Come on, somebody say, I've been walking through something, but it's only preparing me for, for what I'm getting ready to go to. Come on. Come on, punch somebody next to you. Say, you've been walking through something, but it's only preparatory for what you're getting ready to go to. Come on, somebody. Say, I'm going to the next level. Come on. I'm going to the next level. I'm going to the next place God has for me. Hallelujah. Give him a shout of praise. Thanks so much for watching this podcast or if you're just listening to it. Thanks so much for being part of our church service today. I know the Word is so rich and when we give attention to the Word, the Word comes in and does amazing things in our lives. You know, I feel in our church that recently we've just been like sitting on a powder keg of the Holy Spirit and it's just ready to blow. Man, I see lives changed every single week in our church and it's so exciting. I walk out of here sometimes and, and it's like I've had a surreal experience of just seeing God move and do things that I only previously dreamed of. So I'm so glad that you're part of that today. And you know, the greatest decision you can ever make in life is to serve the Lord Jesus, to ask Him into your heart, to make Him the Lord of your life, to ask Him to take away all the sin, all the shame, and all the guilt. If you'd like to pray with me right now and receive Him into your heart, this can happen. You can pray right where you are, whether you're at home or you're at work or wherever you're listening to this. You can pray right now and ask the Lord into your life and He can do something that no other man can do. He can bring peace, He can bring salvation, He can bring healing. So if you're ready for that, just pray with me right now. Say these words, Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I ask that you forgive me of all my sin, that you wash away the guilt, that you wash away the shame. I accept you, Lord Jesus, as my Savior. Come into my life, be the Lord of my life, and help me to serve you from this day forward. In Jesus' name we pray. And you can say amen where you are. I want to pray for you now. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for everyone watching. I ask that you bring healing. I ask that you bring deliverance. I ask that you bring peace of mind. Lord, for those struggling with family problems, Lord, I ask that you come in and speak peace to the storm that's going on in their lives right now. And Lord, we love you. We bless you. We thank you today for who you are. Thank you for the audience listening and watching today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So follow us online. Follow us on our social media pages. Thanks so much for listening. And uh, till next time, walk with the Lord. Be blessed. Grow in the Word. And go forward in Him.